bus lines and main highways in Jefferson County, West Virginia, lies a charming little village of about 300 inhabitants. This town has three names, Smithfield, Middleway, and Clip. The last and best known being derived from the famous manifestations of the Clipping Spook. From the Kingston Daily Freeman newspaper, November 1st, 1926. Hey y'all, welcome to October. Spooky season is finally here, and I hope all of y'all are already having a blast to kick it off. We have so much going on over here that I just can't wait for it all to come out. We've been working very hard, and I'm already looking forward to a big old nap on November 1st. But in the meantime, you can absolutely expect a lot of great content coming your way. On top of the fact that the Southern Gothic Live show is going to be happening in less than a week. That's right, if you haven't heard, I'm going to be on stage slinging stories at the Palace Theater in Gallatin, Tennessee, just outside of Nashville on Friday, October 14th. And I would absolutely love it if y'all came out to hear some grim little tales of ghosts and hauntings and all that spooky sort of stuff. It is going to be a blast. So that's this upcoming Friday, October 14th. The show starts at 7, but doors will open at 6.30. Now, it's going to be awesome, but time is running out, so go get your tickets. Head over to southerngothicmedia.com or click the link in the show notes right now. Don't wait any longer because it is absolutely coming at us fast. That's this Friday, October 14th at the Haunted Palace Theater in Gallatin, Tennessee. I just can't wait, guys. But in the meantime, we should probably go ahead and get on with this episode, right? Because today we've got a very interesting story that sounds a lot like a poltergeist, but there's an angle to it that honestly makes it one of the more unique legends that we've covered here on the podcast. This story takes place in the village of Middleway, West Virginia, a community with a population of less than 500 people. It's located in the lower Shenandoah Valley in the northeastern corner of the state, and the area itself was first settled back in the early 18th century, but honestly, never really took off. Now, its main claim to fame, though, its place in history, it's because it's the home of this legend that dates back to the late 1700s, when a local farmer and his family became the victim of some pretty serious, possibly even evil, manifestations. historic marker stands there in the community today, commemorating these infamous events, describing it as, quote, After the 1794 death of a stranger at Livingston Farm, mysterious noises and clippings of garments frightened Middleway residents for years. This is the mysterious and highly documented legend of Wizard Clip. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you are listening to Southern Gothic. One night in 1794, a man by the name of Adam Livingston was awoken by a knock on the door of his family farmhouse in what was then Smithfield, Virginia. Livingston rose to investigate the source of the knock, but little did he know that this was merely the beginning of a series of events that now seemed far too strange for belief. When Livingston opened his door, on the other side he found a stranger requesting his assistance desperately seeking temporary lodging. Since the farmer was a devout Lutheran and considered by most to be a downright good man, he didn't think twice before agreeing to the request, welcoming the stranger into his home. 
But not long after, the man became seriously ill, testing Livingston's goodwill. The man's symptoms quickly grew so severe that he feared his life was quickly coming to an end. So he asked his host for one more favor before he passed. He wanted a Catholic priest to come to his bedside and administer to him the last rites, a Catholic ceremony meant to prepare and purify a soul for death. But as was said, Livingston was of the Lutheran faith, and according to some, he didn't take kindly to Catholics, telling the sick man, quote, that he knew of no priest in that neighborhood, and if there was one, he should never pass the threshold of this door. But the man continued to beg, Livingston holding his ground, until eventually the sick stranger could hold on for no longer, and he passed on unceremoniously. In fact, Livingston couldn't even recall the name that the man had given him days before and was forced to search his belongings, an endeavor that proved unsuccessful. Although Livingston was unwilling to aid the stranger in his final request, or maybe he was just unable, he was at least willing to provide the man with a proper burial. So on the day of the stranger's passing, he hired a local named Jacob Foster to sit with the body out of respect. Yet when darkness fell, Mr. Foster found he could not keep the candles in the room lit. The flame would remain for a time, but then suddenly sputter out and leave the room in darkness. After several attempts to relight the candles, the issue was brought up to Livingston, who then moved two candles from his family's living area to the room where the stranger's body lay at rest. These candles had been used all evening, so they knew they were able to stay lit. But that is not what happened. Just like the candles before them, the flames extinguished seemingly without cause, and the darkness arrived once more. Jacob Foster was so disturbed by what was going on that he abandoned his vigil and fled the home, later insisting that if there had been some outside source or wind having caused this to happen, he was entirely unaware of it. Either way, the following day, the stranger was buried in a grave on the property of Adam Livingston, and strange occurrences seemed to follow not long after. The earliest of these downright eerie happenings were the noises. Disembodied sounds that echoed across the Livingston property. The most prominent of these was the sound of galloping horses that the family claimed to hear in the evenings and at night. But thorough searches of their farm uncovered absolutely nothing. Yet the noises continued. At the time, this was of course unnerving, but in the grand scheme of things, it was probably the least intrusive of anything that would happen to the Livingstons, as soon enough, a number of disastrous events would unfold on the family farm. The barn burned to the ground, livestock died mysteriously or disappeared entirely, and some even claimed that chickens and turkeys were found with their heads entirely removed. Inside the family home, cookware was found thrown upon the floor and irreparably broken without any apparent cause. And eerily, burning logs and embers would seemingly leap from the fireplace. Money even disappeared from where it was kept for safekeeping and the sound of a spectral bell could be heard ringing in the distance, seemingly coming from nowhere. It heard by everyone. But of all these poltergeist-like activities, there was one in particular that made the home famous, or better yet, infamous, both at the time and today. At first, it was heralded by the sounds of heavy shears making a distinctive clipping noise throughout the home, until eventually, items were discovered with mysterious damage. Anything and everything made of cloth that could be clipped by shears 
fell victim to a strange manifestation that left the shape of half moons cut out in them. Clothing, sheets, blankets, even boots were discovered to have been clipped by these phantom shears. One account of the event, published in 1879, dubbed it the Cliptown Spirit, who with the work of invisible hands, quote, garments of different kinds in the house or worn by visitors were clipped all over into semicircular figures an inch or two long. Of course, it was clothing most likely to fall prey to the unseen clippers, as it was frequently found mysteriously cut into strings, quote, generally by a spiral clip going round and round the doomed article. Perhaps unsurprisingly, these strange goings-on at the Livingston home began to attract the attention of members of the local community. And it's said that people traveled upwards of 30 miles to visit the farm for the opportunity to witness it with their own eyes. And as a result, unsurprisingly, many became believers when upon their arrival, they found that their own belongings were becoming victim to the Cliptown spirit. One of the most well-remembered visitors was an older Presbyterian woman who went to satisfy her curiosity. Upon her arrival at the farm, she took off her new silk cap and wrapped it in a silk handkerchief before placing it in her pocket, protecting it from being clipped. Then, upon exiting the home, she pulled the handkerchief from her pocket and it was still in perfect condition, but when she opened it, she discovered to her horror that her cap had been cut to ribbons. Other visitors included three adventurous young men who felt confident enough in their disbelief to actually ask the family if they might stay overnight. The family agreed, yet moments after they sat down in the house, a great stone was said to come flying from the fireplace and whirl around the floor with such speed that it sent one of the men fleeing, utterly convinced of the supernatural. Reportedly, at one point, some of the many visitors were stopped by what appeared to be a rope blocking the road on the way to the farmhouse. Yet when one of them tried to grab it or move the rope away, they discovered that it was nothing more than an illusion. These were just some of the many paranormal experiences that folks had on the Livingston property. And to the ever-increasing dismay and horror of Adam and his family, these strange occurrences and manifestations continued on for years before relief finally came. According to legend, there were no reports of actual physical harm being brought upon the Livingston family members. But the manifestations were certainly distressing enough and so widely known that most everyone was of the opinion that the source of the activity must certainly be evil. So unsurprisingly, in an attempt to rid himself of the seemingly demonic force, Adam Livingston turned to the church. First, he sought the help of his local Lutheran minister, but his efforts failed to produce any relief for the family. Next, Livingston ventured south, away from his own faith, and received the help of two Methodist ministers. But these men also failed in driving away whatever it was that plagued the family. Then, everything changed when one night, Adam Livingston had a dream. It's said that he saw a beautiful church, and inside it was a quote, minister dressed in peculiar robes. He then heard a voice reveal to him, quote, that is the man who can relieve you. So upon waking, Adam Livingston became determined to seek out the robed man in his vision. He first visited an Episcopal minister, for he knew that they dressed in such robes. But it took some time for the reverend to convince a distraught Adam Livingston that despite the robes, he was certainly not the man in his dream, for he was not in the business of removing, quote, 
spells, ghosts, and things of that nature. The Reverend instead encouraged Livingston to seek out a Catholic priest, since the Catholic Church is, quote, more familiar with such things. Of course, Livingston was leery to heed this advice, but at this point, he was so desperate for the manifestations to end that he went to visit the McSherry family, about four miles from his own property, who were devout Catholics. Mrs. McSherry told him that the following Sunday, a priest would be celebrating Mass at a home in Shepherdstown nearby if he'd like to join them. So the following Sunday, he did just that, and when Father Dennis Cahill arrived wearing his vestments, Livingston was said to have burst into tears, exclaiming, quote, That is the man I saw in my dream. He is the one who will relieve me. Yet Father Cahill took a bit of convincing before he finally agreed to go out to the Livingston property and investigate the purported claims. Upon his arrival, he questioned the entirety of the family, who all told the same stories of the strange and unsettling occurrences in the house. But what Father Cahill did next is unclear. Some say he walked the property and said blessings while sprinkling the house with holy water. Others insist that in addition to simple blessings, he also included prayers of exorcism. But whatever it is that he did, or prayers that he said, it seemed to work, as all the supernatural activity, including the strange clipping, ceased. In fact, according to legend, even the Livingston's money that had gone missing reappeared on the threshold of the home. Ultimately, though, this peace did not last, and several days later, the activity was said to have started up once more. So Father Cahill again returned and interviewed the family. But this time, it was decided that he'd actually celebrate a mass inside the home. Again, the manifestation ceased, and the family was able to live in peace once more. Father Cahill's assistance and the result that followed was such a big deal to the Livingston family that they now sought to become educated in the Catholic faith. And soon after, along with many neighbors who witnessed the strange occurrences, they converted to Catholicism with a deep devotion. It was by this time that word of what was happening and the intervention of the church had spread far enough to reach Baltimore where it caught the ear of Bishop John Carroll. Intrigued by the story, Carroll sent a Jesuit priest, Father Demetrius A. Golitsyn, to investigate the happenings in what was then called Cliptown by many. Father Golitsyn entered the home skeptical, hoping to disprove it all with either science or psychology. But when Golitsyn entered, the strange activity that had previously been banished by Father Cahill returned for the duration of the Jesuits' stay there. And in the end, his skepticism turned to belief. Golitsyn wrote, My view in coming to Virginia and remaining there three months was to investigate those extraordinary facts at Livingston's, of which I had heard so much, and which I could not prevail upon myself to believe. But I was soon converted to a full belief of them. No lawyer in a court of justice did ever examine or cross-examine witnesses more strictly than I did, all those I could procure. Now that the disturbing activities had resumed once again, Father Golitsyn came to the conclusion that their source must be demonic in nature, and he immediately began to exorcise them with the prayers of the church. But as the prayers increased, so too did the activity. The sounds of rattling and rumbling grew louder and louder within the house, and this concerned the priest greatly, so he called another to come to his assistance, a man by the name of Father Cahill. Cahill kneeled with the Jesuit, continued the prayers, and commanded that the evil spirits leave the house 
and cease all their disturbances to the Livingston family. Though there seemed to be resistance at first, the men pressed onward, and eventually, the spirits were conquered and compelled to obey. The seemingly evil manifestations were finally gone for good, never to return. But while the Livingstons were finally able to breathe easy, that their torment had come to an end, their experiences with the supernatural were far from over. And in some ways, what followed was far more impactful than what they had already experienced. We'll explore some of these events, the historical context of the legend, and more after the break. When Adam Livingston received a knock on his door from a stranger in 1794, he had absolutely no idea of the scope of events that would soon befall him and his family. Fortunately, with the help of several Catholic priests, the Livingstons were able to regain a sense of peace and calm in their home. However, they were not entirely free of the supernatural. It was not long after Golitsyn's visit that the Livingston family began hearing what was described as a, quote, consoling voice. It was said to have first come as a bright light that awoke the farmer from his slumber late one night. In a clear, sweet tone, he was told to rise and gather his family in prayer. The mysterious voice then prayed with them and guided the family's prayers. According to legend, this voice stayed with the Livingston family for 17 years, and many believe that it must have been that of a soul trapped in purgatory, and that in life it had likely been a priest, for it had a great knowledge of Latin and the liturgical hymns. Many described the manifestation as a great teacher to the Livingstons and others who had converted to the Catholic faith, for the teachings they once only dimly understood now became clear, fascinating, and more beautiful when explained to them by the unseen spirit. Over the course of the 17 years that the voice remained with the family, it frequently instructed them to pray for the souls in purgatory, quote, whose agony the voice could never weary of describing. In addition, Adam Livingston became an agent for good works under its direction, often waking in the night to undertake long journeys when someone had taken ill or was suffering intense hardship. He was also said to receive messages without any explanation that he was told to pass on to various people, and these messages regularly proved to bring great relief to the recipients. Who the voice had been in life was never discovered, though it was said that the truth would be revealed to Adam Livingston if he stayed true to his faith. Yet whether or not he ever learned that truth before his death in 1820 is unknown, as he never shared it with another man. In 1802, the Livingstons left their home in what was then Smithfield or Cliptown and moved to Pennsylvania. And the voice went with them, spreading the story even farther afield. Yet prior to his departure from what is now West Virginia, it was said to have told the farmer that his land, quote, would one day become a great place of prayer. So in gratitude for the help of the Catholic Church and easing his troubles, and through the guidance of this new supernatural presence in his life, Livingston deeded approximately 35 to 38 acres of his land to the Catholic Church as, quote, a field to sustain a priest. This land has since become known as the priest's field. 
At first, the acreage was used as a cemetery until a chapel was built in 1923 to honor the souls trapped in purgatory who were awaiting their penance and purification to enter heaven. This chapel eventually became a place of pilgrimage and devotion, and 50 years later, a retreat center was built on the property, aptly named the Priest Field Pastoral Center, operated by the Catholic Diocese of Wheeling, Charleston. This center is still in operation to this very day as a, quote, center for Christian life, where people can walk with Jesus and experience him through personal and group retreats, authentic community, and the beauty of a creekside cedar forest in wild, wonderful West Virginia. The voice was right. The land became a place of great prayer. Of course, what of the tale itself? Unlike most legends, this one has quite the paper trail. The earliest recounting of the events came from the letters of Father Demetrius A. Galitzin, written in 1797 and later published in 1873. Another publication was also released describing the Livingston's experiences in 1870 under the title The Mystery of the Wizard Clip which compiled memories and stories from individuals that had witnessed the strange occurrences or the descendants of those who had passed on their memories. But here's the thing. Most of these accounts and later published works all seem to be sources attributed to either a religious individual or one that leans heavily into the concept of the Catholic Church's miraculous ability to exercise and banish mysterious and possibly evil spirits. As such, it's unsurprising that many modern historians lean toward the origin of the story as a bit of propaganda, a means for the Catholic Church to build and spread its message during the early days of American history. The story was so popular that it was told all across the countryside and was used to provide evidence of the Catholic faith's ability to defeat unexplainable evil when all other Christian denominations failed to do so. But does this mean that the supernatural manifestations of Wizard Clip didn't happen? Well, not necessarily. All it means is that those folks had a reason to spread the tale. In addition, there are of course some elements that vary between retellings specifically the fact that some claim prior to moving to Smithfield, or what's now Middleway, the Livingston family were already suffering from the same so-called evil manifestations. That it was this move that was an attempt to escape the problem that drove the family to resettle there. Obviously, this conflicts with the story element that the trauma brought upon the Livingston family was actually the result of Adam Livingston's failure to aid the unidentified stranger who asked for a Catholic priest. But whether or not that matters is questionable, as it might just be a small narrative addition after the fact. Of course, the most enduring question of all is what is the origin of the use of the word wizard in conjunction with the mystery of wizard clip? Unfortunately, This is unknown. The word wizard is not a term that was included in the writings of Father Galitzin. Although the name Wizard Clip, or Wizard's Clip, was clearly already in the oral tradition when the story was published under that title 80 years later. Most speculate that it actually has something to do with the crescent moon shape that was clipped from clothing, which likely led some to link it with elements of the occult. But honestly, Your guess is as good as ours. No matter the origin or veracity of the tale of Adam Livingston and the clipping spirit, the legend has firmly ingrained itself in the history of Middleway, West Virginia, and continues to be told to this very day. As published in the Kingston Daily Freeman, On November 1st, 1926, 
Quote, anyone in middle way, young or old, Catholic or Protestant, can tell the story of the wizard clip. And when the tale has been related, the narrator will shake his head and say, I'm telling you just as it was told to me by my grandfather. I cannot explain it. My name is Brandon Schecksneider, and you've been listening to Southern Gothic. Southern Gothic is an independently produced podcast created by siblings Brianne and Brandon Schecksneider with the support of listeners like you. This month, we'd like to thank our most recent Patreon supporters, Casey Jimerick, M. Moria Nichols, Zachariah Perdue, Melissa Verval, and Rebecca Von Groot. And of course, our super fans who have pledged $10 a month, Angeline Huffman and Alexandria Perry. If you're interested in joining us and receiving additional content, including ad-free episodes, head over to our Patreon page today. The link is in the show notes. Lucky Lady Shacks.